Hello. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay uh, in procedures there. Um, my name is Giorgio Framalico. I'm the Deputy Director with responsibility for planning and transport regulatory services. I'll be chairing this live uh, transport question. Um, the next thing I was going to say was plan, but it was to apologise for any um, of you know, teething problems that we have this evening. It's the first time that we've done this kind of event. Apologies for starting late. Uh, so hopefully we've got over those teething problems already and we're good to go. Uh, so but do forgive us for um, any issues that arise during this evening and do give us your feedback after the session on what went well and what we can do better next time. I need to introduce the panel first of all, uh, Councillor Tony Page, Deputy Leader of Reading Borough Council and Lead Councillor for Strategic Environment, Planning and Transport. We're also, also joined on the panel by Councillor uh, Adele Barnett Ward, who is Chair of the Strategic Environment, Planning and Transport committee and chair of the cleaner air and safer transport forum we will be answering questions that are have been sent to us before so questions that are given to us live during the event and on the screen now you should be able to see the instructions for how that works so there's a there's an icon in the top right hand corner uh, which you click on uh, and then it opens up a window where you can write your question uh, we may try to answer all your questions this evening uh, but certainly what we will do is uh, after the event is uh, answer as many as we possibly can uh, so that we can follow up on the questions that you are asking. To start off the evening, to ask Tony Page uh, to do a brief introduction on the transport strategy. Tony. George, thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, welcome to those who have taken the trouble to join us this evening. As George said, this is the first ever. We've had some technical hitches, uh, but I hope uh, uh, you will find this of uh, use. The um, Reading Transport Strategy, just by way of background, um, is uh, the most radical and important one, we believe, and it's important to emphasise it was written and published uh, literally um, a few days before lockdown. And so we have the situation of consulting on a transport strategy that was written pre-COVID emergency, but whose central themes for a cleaner, healthier and more sustainable Reading are just as valid, if not more so, than when the document was drafted. And our consultation, therefore, invites people to reflect on what was, on what is and on what might be. And our strategy aims to tackle the continuing issue of poor air quality, congestion and to help to achieve our net zero carbon tar tar target. Sorry by 2030. The consultation runs until the end of August and the link at the bottom www.reading.gov.uk forward slash transport 2036 uh, is where inf more information can be found. Um, the vision for that underpins our uh, strategy um, is to deliver a sustainable transport system in Reading um, that uh, uh, creates an attractive, green and vibrant town with neighbourhoods uh, that promote healthy choices and well-being. Future mobility options will enable everyone in Reading to thrive, enjoy an exceptional quality of life and adapt to meet future challenges and opportunities. Uh, now, how prescient that was. Uh, the challenges and opportunities have been much more unsettled um, since that was drafted. Um, and the other point, and sorry, Vicky, just go back um, one slide. You've preempted um, the final point to emphasize about the transport strategy is that it sits and links with other um, uh, strategies and priorities. The Reading 2050 vision, setting out the work that we've done with the university, Reading UK, and the private sector about the sort of uh, initiatives we want to see leading Reading to a much cleaner, greener and healthier environment. We have a climate emergency strategy also um, being consulted upon and that consultation runs until the end of June. And the new local plan, um, which again written pre-COVID um, and based on substantial growth in housing both within Reading and surrounding Reading. And one of the key issues uh, that we invite people to reflect on 
is the way in which this growth in population is going to be accommodated both within Reading and travelling into and out of effectively the regional capital of the Thames Valley. And if that growth in housing, nearly 17,000 units in Reading over the next 20 years, um, and about three or four times that amount outside of Reading, if that's going to be accommodated, we have to travel in healthier ways and in ways that don't pollute and cause congestion. So that brings us on to the central objectives um, of the strategy, uh, which are five, um, creating a clean and green Reading, which I've mentioned, supporting healthy lifestyles, critically important um, at the present time, um, enabling sustainable and inclusive growth. Um, and uh, that means that we have to uh, um, look at uh, the way in which uh, we travel um, around the borough, and the quality um, of the uh, growth that we are uh, supporting. Um, connecting people and places um, already referred to, we need to travel in a way that doesn't cause the pollution and congestion uh, in the past, and we need to embrace smart technologies and solutions um, that are moving fast, not only around um, electric car technology, which offers some uh, improvements, but also around the technology of mass rapid transit, which whilst public transport is to a certain extent out of bounds at the present time, we can only survive as a uh, town, city and as a country if public transport uh, is improved and gets back to its uh, former service. Which brings us on to the key schemes and initiatives in the 20. 36 transport strategy. Um, central um, to uh, the strategy are a number of options to deliver much improved air quality. And uh, clean air zones um, are already established in some parts of the uh, country. Uh, road user charging at certain times of the day or all times of the day and a workplace parking uh, levy are all options uh, that are set out in more detail in the strategy. We haven't decided which one or combination of the three um, will be used, uh, but personally, uh, I think that we have to embrace at least one of these um, demand management options if we're to deliver the improved air quality and reduce congestion. Just one example, about a third of traffic on the distribution road at peak hours um, is using Reading as a shortcut. Um, that contributes congestion and pollution and isn't acceptable and must be reduced. Uh, the way in which we do that is set out uh, in the um, uh, transport strategy for further comment. Uh, we need to improve um, options around mass transit, uh, bus and cycle corridors, uh, we need to look at the way in which we uh, enhance our local centres to reduce the need uh, for travelling around uh, the town. But above all, uh, we need to recognise uh, that uh, whilst there will be improved, uh, whilst there will be increased demand for travel, um, the private car cannot be the mode that absorbs that increased requirement to travel. It has to come through walking or cycling. Uh, or public transport. And whilst public transport was a realistic alternative to the private car uh, pre-health uh, emergency, it will not be for the next few months, hopefully only a short period. Uh, but uh, we have to therefore plan um, on the basis that we will need interim arrangements before we can get back uh, to the full use of public transport. And therefore, active travel schemes uh, which is walking um, and cycling uh, comes into its own. Uh, it offers mobility as well as improved public health and well-being. Uh, moving on to the immediate, and that brings us on to the immediate um, uh, pandemic um, and the changes we've seen. Um, the traffic levels are around about a third of what they were pre-pandemic uh, levels. 
And that's resulted in something like a 35 to 40% reduction in levels of nitrogen dioxide. Uh, people living on main roads, and I live on a very busy main road out of the town centre on Castle Hill, um, we have noticed the um, palpable improvement in air quality, um, as well as reduced levels of traffic, uh, quieter um, and uh, uh, much more uh, conducive. And uh, I would hope that one of the benefits, if there are any, streets that cost uh, this crisis. And our transport strategy um, already has plenty of options to uh, build on those uh, on the current situation. And we need to lock in as far as possible the benefits from reduced levels of traffic and increased levels of physical activity um, in Reading. Um, as such, we've brought forward uh, a number of schemes um, in response to the uh, government's uh, recent guidance. Moving on, please, Vic. Um, the government issued transport guidance um, about 10 days ago requiring not asking, but requiring local councils to bring forward urgently schemes uh, to provide more space for walking and cycling. And Reading's responded to this, and we have the advantage of a good local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, which was uh, completed at the end of last year. Um, and we've been able to identify schemes that complement our wider, longer term uh, strategies, but deliver immediate uh, improvements. Sidmouth Street, we're talking about uh, removing the southbound lane for traffic and converting it uh, to cycling and walking. Gosbrook Road, Westfield Road, um, I'm sure we will speak more about this and Adele, my colleague who's with us this evening, represents that area and that's some one-way proposals in that area. And on Reading Bridge, um, we're talking um, about, well, we are removing a lane of traffic um, uh, southbound in order uh, to provide greater cycling and walking space uh, over the bridge. The other schemes in Southampton Street, Redlands Road, Oxford Road and London Road are in the pipeline um, for further work, but those first three schemes were aiming to deliver by the end of June. And as this map shows, uh, the whole borough has been identified and we've got ambitious proposals for those um, other roads. I will leave it there, George, as we're uh, running a bit late and hope that introduction gives a flavour uh, of what we're thinking. Um, but I suppose the key message I would uh, leave with people is that I don't think, and people may differ, that the current crisis is going to see us returning to normal as it was. More homeworking, less reason to travel in peak hours, perhaps staggered school hours, a whole range of changes uh, are underway uh, that are likely to influence the demand for travel, might reduce it at peak hours, but either way we have to now uh, review and revise um, our plans based on a strategy that was written pre-emergency but is still very much relevant to the current crisis and how we come out of it. George, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Tony. Um, as you say, uh, we, we've lost a bit of time at the start, but so let's go straight to the, uh, the questions. And firstly, thank you for everyone that sent in their uh, questions. And just to remind viewers uh, about the option to provide questions live uh, throughout this, uh, this evening session. So the first question we had submitted was from a resident called Nikki. Uh, she asked, why are you so anti-car? Tony, would um, you like to answer this one? Yes, and I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. We're not anti-car, we're pro-local environment. Um, we are talking about rebalancing uh, transport in Reading in a way that promotes more walking and cycling and protects public transport. And uh, I think all car drivers are at some stage a pedestrian. Uh, they also use public transport. Uh, so we need to focus on the variety of means of travel and uh, there will always be some car drivers that do need to use their car, people with disabilities, uh, people who are doing essential deliveries. Um, 
but uh, there are large numbers of people who use their cars locally for very short journeys who need to be encouraged for health reasons, their own health, as well as the community's health, to look at other options for travelling. And the current crisis, um, egged on, and rightly so by Grant Shapps, and I don't always say nice things about government ministers, but I think the Secretary of State for Transport has done a good job in urging us to bring forward short-term measures. Uh, they've promised us funding. We're still to receive the details of that, uh, but that funding will be deployed for the whole community. So we're not anti-car, we're pro-improvements to our local environment. Okay, thank you, Tony. Let's go to a second question uh, which is on the screen now so the question is from emma thomas uh, i have noticed a huge improvement to air quality and improvement to my breathing since the traffic has reduced recently how can reading try and keep the pollution down as people start to cross for both uh, tony do you want to start well, why, why doesn't adele go first i think people have heard enough of me oh. for me <laughs> adele do you want to start on that uh, on that question Absolutely. Thanks, George. And, and thanks for sending the question in, Emma. Um, I think there's two different, uh, three, sorry, different sections of, of how Reading can try and keep the pollution down as people start to return to the work. There's what we do as individuals, there's what we can do as organisations, and then there's what the council can do, what the local authority can do. I think what we can do as individuals, we have, this is such a terrible time, and so much tragedy but the uh, one benefit that we have had is that people have had the opportunity to reimagine their local area um i don't live on quite such a busy road as uh, tony does but i do live on a connection don't live on such a busy road it is a connecting road and it has been lovely to have lower levels of traffic and to actually be able to speak to neighbors across the road which i usually can't do because there are too many cars um, and we've all had that opportunity to think about movement in reading as people not just vehicles and a lot of uh, transport design has been about moving vehicles around towns rather than about moving people around towns so i think what we can do as individuals is to not have our car as the default to think for each journey do i have to do that by car could i walk could i cycle could i take the bus obviously i'm thinking not right now uh, with the bus then as organizations um those of us who are employers need to look and say do does that member of staff have to be in the building could they do more homeworking could they be more flexible how can we make um i for example i offer people uh, shift times based around bus timetables uh, no one's actually taking me up on it <laughs> I do offer it and then as a local authority what we have to do is to make it safe and pleasant and attractive to walk and cycle around car dominated streets are not streets that are nice for pedestrians and cyclists to walk in uh, so we have to work to reimagine um, something that I'm very keen on is the concept of livable neighbourhoods and this is all, all based around giving people a sense of community and designing streets at person size rather than at car size Right, hopefully that got through and <laughs> back to you. Oh, Tony, if you'd like to take over. No, no, no. You've covered it. I've got nothing to add. So, so hopefully, hopefully uh, people were able to hear you there, Adele. Thank you for your for that uh, that answer. There's a there's a question posted on the live uh, Q and A uh, from Keith Faulkner. If I can ask that uh, this question of the of the panel. So, Keith is saying the transport strategy 2036 is very comprehensive and thorough. I do though have one question. With the likelihood of moving back to more local structures and increases in home working, has any consideration been given to the idea that Reading consists of a number of small interconnected villages and that local people may want to travel from one to the other without going through the centre of the, of the town? Uh, any thoughts on, on that, Tony or, or Adele? Who would like to start on that? Uh we haven't, candidly, Keith, we haven't given a great deal of thought to that. It's a very valid uh, question. As a council, we, we uh, um, have already articulated our strong support in our local plan uh, towards the need uh, uh, to enhance our local centres. Um, and there's a recognition there. Incidentally, um, the government awarded us £150,000 uh, today towards uh, um, high streets work. And one of the things that both myself and the leader of the council are keen to do is to look at uh, what support we might be able to offer some of the local centres uh, because the town centre is obviously important but our local centres whether it be the early road, the Caversham, Meadway Precinct, Tilehurst, Northumberland Avenue down in Whitley, um, Wokingham Road, these are all very important local centres and of course 
in the current emergency, many of those shops have seen an increase in trade um, as a result of people uh, not traveling and, and patronizing their local shops. Um, so there's a good deal of strength in what you say. And it's something that, that I would certainly want to uh, take away. And I hope that you will put that in as a submission um, in response to the consultation. Adele, have you got anything? Um, yes, Tony, this is something that I think about a lot because I um, have children and I spent a long time with small children. And it's something that those small journeys that women and often retired people, people without cars make, uh, and transport structures aren't necessarily designed around that. And certainly it's something in the past that has been the case with cycle routes is they tend to be based around work areas. So connecting you from a living area to a work area when mm. actually if you're going to if a mum's going to do the school run on a bicycle, she needs safe cycle, not necessarily routes, not necessarily paths. Sometimes it's quiet in streets. It's those livable neighbourhoods again. But she needs to have that um, within her local area. So connecting you to the shops, to the preschool, to the school. And so definitely within our LC whip, that is something that we looked at. Uh, the strategy also includes orbital routes that connect local centres without having to travel into and out of town. And you've had bus routes have often been like that. You've got to go into the centre and come out. We've now got the new connection through Carol Lane. So hopefully at some point we'll see an orbital bus route going through there. So um, it's certainly something that I think about in the planning. It's something something we've got in the LC whip of, the, of helping people connect without using cars into their local area and not just into the town centre. OK, thank you. Thank you, Adele. Uh, we'll go back to one of the questions that was asked before the uh, this evening. Then It's from Mary Mace, as it's on the screen here. So Mary's saying, I'm writing with regard to the recent active travel scheme proposals. This is, these are the schemes that Tony uh, introduced as part of his uh, presentation. Is this to be done without consultation? I think that it will only push up the mileage done by car drivers because they won't be able to travel from A to B easily. Tony, can I ask you to, to respond to that? Yeah, let me just deal with the uh, the consultation issue and then I'll ask Adele to, to comment specifically about um, those proposals in her area. Um, the government has made it clear in the guidance that they want measures taken as swiftly as possible. And that's an instruction to local authorities um, and in the words of the guidance as swiftly as possible and in any event within weeks uh, and our first batch of proposals are therefore brought forward on that basis and the government is recommending that we use a temporary traffic regulation order procedure which minimizes consultation at the start of this process but because it's temporary there is a maximum 18 month life for these uh, proposals. Now, we will take a decision much sooner than 18 months as to whether these schemes are uh, proving their worth. And we would then, if we intended to make them permanent, we will embark on the full statutory consultation that we would normally do. Reading has a proud record of consulting informally and then uh, formally through the statutory process. Um, but I can give a categorical assurance that if um, all any or all of these schemes are intended to be made permanent, we will give people the full opportunity uh, to comment. And I think the advantage of this expedited procedure is that people will be able to comment on what actually has happened or is happening rather than speculate on what might happen, which is the normal process around consultations. Um, so whilst it would have been ideal to have had um, more uh, consultation in advance, government is telling us move quickly for the reasons I think we understand. But I can assure you that if we are intended to go permanent or if we amend them um, and then go permanent, there will be full consultation. Adele, do you want to comment on the Gosbrook uh, Westfield proposals? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Tony. Um, and also more widely on uh, the, the second part of Mary's question there, which is about pushing up the mileage by car drivers because they won't be able to travel from A to B easily. Uh, what we're seeing across the country in areas that have moved to introduce livable neighbourhoods, to introduce modal filtering, which uh, is what a fancy term to mean having roads that are no through roads for cars, but let through people on bikes and people walking, uh, is that it doesn't displace those journeys onto nearby roads. It reduces the journeys because 
some of those car journeys, the short non-essential car journeys, which are the ones that we all need to think about whether we really need to make that journey. If you do have to go a little bit longer for it and you could walk or you could go by bike, actually, you probably will. And that's certainly what they're finding. If you have a look, I think the website's called Enjoy Waltham Forest. Uh, Waltham Forest is one of the mini Holland schemes in London. They are a long way down this track and they have improved air quality across the borough and they have the data there to show there are fewer car journeys happening it's not just that they're being moved and it's not creating congestion it's actually reducing congestion and improving air quality uh, on Cabersham itself i had um, a few residents contacted me about the one way on westfield road and gosbrook road and i think this was because there had been quite a long time ago now there'd been a scheme to have one way down westfield road two lanes of traffic and people thought that that's what we were proposing to do now, which it isn't. Uh, this isn't something that um, we actually had in forward planning. This is a direct response to what the government said about making space for social distancing on pavements. And it started with Gosbrook Road, that short section between Westfield Road and the centre of Caversham. Those who know it will know the pavements are extremely narrow there, particularly on the, on the southern side. You cannot pass. And what's been happening with when the streets were very, very quiet during lockdown is people stepping out into the street. Now, as traffic's picking up a bit, people are having to make the decision to either step out into the street to observe social distancing or not be able to social distance on that pavement. So it's obvious that we have to try and do something there to protect people, to let them keep that two metres apart that's so important without endangering themselves as we start to see more cars on the road. So the proposal there is to take it down to one lane so that there's space and we're still drawing up plans for that. Um, and once we have those plans, we will be publicising those. And it's an important route because it connects you to the centre of Caversham. It also connects people down to Thameside School for the school run. And then on Westfield Road, that's an important route for the school run for Thameside School, for the Heights School, to a certain extent for St Anne's, but also for older pupils heading up to High Dam, um, coming from Lower Caversham will travel up that road. So again, there's the opportunity to make more space for pedestrians. And this will be one lane of, 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 of one way. There'll still be uh, the residents will still be able to park on the road. The plans will come out as soon as we've got them. And this will all be done with signage and barriers. So as local councillors, the ward councillors, we're going to be paying very close attention. I know my residents will be paying close attention as well. If it doesn't work the way we think it will, it will work, we can alter it or we can just take it out. And that's the beauty of that scheme there. It is temporary and it is experimental. And it would only ever, we have the possibility in the report that it could have a consultation for permanence, but certainly from the point of view of the Caversham Ward councillors, we'd only support consultation if people said to us, please don't let it go back to the way it was. Um, it's certainly, we've got no agenda of wanting to keep that permanent. It's, it's a response to the need to social distance in the centre of Caversham. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just before the evening, but just before we get to that one, it's going to, um, Louisa Guise has asked a question which we've, uh, we've I think we've generally answered, uh, but there's an additional comment from, from Louisa. She's saying about please prioritise pedestrians, cyclists, transits, cars in this order. Electric cars are not a solution to improve congestion. Any thoughts on, on that uh, statement actually, but in terms of electric cars and, and what this might mean in terms of a potential solution to our um, issues in Reading? Adele, do you want to? Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can. I completely agree with Louisa. Electric cars are a, re a good solution for those journeys that have to be made by car. Um, there aren't actually. There are many things that could be accomplished not by car. For example, e-cargo e bikes. I've seen a fridge taken on a bike. If you really want to, you can take it by bike. But there will be people and journeys that have to go in a car, and where that's the best solution. And electric vehicles are a decent solution to that. But if we just took, if we could take every petrol and diesel car off the road now and replace it with an electric vehicle, we would still have pollution. Um, they cause pollution in their manufacture. They cause particulate pollution from the brakes. Um, obviously, you're assuming that the electricity is green generated, which it isn't necessarily. Uh, but also, you still have the problems of congestion. You still have the risk. The people who are least likely to own a car, which is young people, people with disabilities and mobility issues, older people are most likely to be injured by a car. So if we're going to reimagine our streets, if we're going to build back better uh, from this crisis, then we do need to have fewer cars on the streets. So I'm really pleased that we have been pushing electric charging points in Reading. It's a real challenge for people who don't have off street parking to have um, electric cars. We've been we're putting charging points into lampposts. We're looking at other ways to put charging points in. But absolutely, they're part of the solution. But it, if we just swap straight over and carry drive on driving at the same rate we do now, we're still going to have real problems with congestion and pollution in Reading. 
Thanks, thanks, Adele. So let's um, let's go to that pre um, question from Dave Hubbard from Southcote. He says, as Reading has a highly successful bus service, how can the council ensure buses are not not caught up in congestion caused by commuter cars from housing developments outside of Reading? Tony, can I give that one to you? Yes, uh, Dave, uh, a very appropriate uh, question. Um, the uh, uh, the course, the challenge at the moment is that we have to. Uh, fight to protect and uh, retain our bus company because of course along with all other bus companies only about 10 percent of uh, the former patronage uh, is using uh, public transport and uh, people are apprehensive for health reasons and following government guidance so the short-term survival for reading buses is the uh, order uh, of the day and we're hopeful to get some more government support to assist in that uh, process. Uh, but the strategy recognises that uh, public transport uh, into and out of Reading is critical um, to the future development. I mentioned at the start that loads more, something like 45 to 50,000 new units of housing will be provided around Reading um, over the next 20 years. There's a possibility of a new town at Graisley, although government funding for that was not forthcoming uh, pre the uh, pandemic, um, but we are certainly um, conscious of the need to ensure that the way in which people travel into Reading um, is based on much more use of public transport, which is why our transport strategy uh, talks about the need for more park and ride sites, particularly to the north of Reading in Oxfordshire or in South Oxfordshire, and we need the cooperation much more of Oxfordshire County Council and South Oxfordshire to deliver park and ride sites. We're talking about um, a northern orbital road to link those park and ride sites uh, round the north and east of uh, uh, the borough to a third Thames bridge, which would also be um, heavily prioritised for public transport, walking and cycling. Um, so uh, the strategy was written, as I said at the beginning, pre-crisis um, and uh, uh, the extent to which we can get public transport back to its former glory in Reading will be one of the great challenges. Reading has the third highest use of public transport buses outside of London. Places like Brighton and Nottingham only exceed us just and uh, the dependency on successful public transport is absolutely critical uh, to the future um, of the town. Whether we see as much growth in the next few years uh, may help us in terms of congestion and therefore the amount of new housing provided in Reading and around Reading might ease off and as we both Adele and I have said changing work patterns and the way in which we live may also assist in reducing those congestion spikes and having a smoother uh, use of our road network, which will be in everybody's interest, whether they're walking, cycling or in buses. Adele, do you want to add anything? Um, uh, I think you pretty much covered it. Obviously, I represent a North Reading ward and we have the particular challenge of the bridges. So I was really pleased to see in the uh, response to our transport strategy consultation last year, uh, the support that there was there it was overwhelming support for reallocating road space to more sustainable modes of travel, it, which includes uh, the buses, because we need reliable bus lanes <laughs> from Caversham yeah. if we to have the sort of reliable bus service that, for example, people living along the route of the 17 have, because um, the council has been able to provide bus lanes, red routes and things like that across that route that they can't currently provide for the routes that cross the river. Thank you, Adele. Thank you, Tony. I'm just going to take a, a quick question that's been submitted uh, live then from Ollie. Um, so we talked about um, bus lanes there, but um, I think Ollie's asking uh, kind of another, another step on from there perhaps. So his question, so his question is, considering you said that a third of traffic on the IDR is through traffic, would you consider removing lanes to disincentivise through traffic? The IDR, Baston Road, Forbury Road, dual carriageways, unpleasant moat around the town centre, removing lanes would make it less of a barrier. Uh, Adele, do you, do you want to comment on, on, on that? So it's removing lanes. Uh, removing lanes on our three routes to reallocate space for cycling with that, sorry. 
I, I, the, so what he's not saying, uh, it's not clear as to whether it's a, removing it entirely and just reducing the amount of road space uh, in terms of all or actually realigning or reallocating that to cycle or bus bus day. I'm reading it, but I read it first of all. Yeah, I, I was trying to read it. It's removing it entirely. So uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm trying to read it as you're speaking, and I'm getting myself a bit confused. We're all very new to this. Um, it's interesting because yes, I don't like having a great big road go go through Reading. I that's the transport planners of the 60s did Reading a great disservice, I think, in developing the IDR. And you'd certainly want to reduce the demand. Uh, if you build it, they will come. So by the adverse, if you remove it, will they go away? Um, I don't actually know. Um, from my point of view, and I think this comes back to what I was talking about before and what Keith raised about the local centres, um, the IDR isn't that useful a route um, for a lot of the journeys that I'm thinking about. If you're thinking about the short inessential journeys. So it's not something that I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about. I will think about it now, um, but I don't have a sort of quick answer prepared to that. It's an interesting, interesting um, idea and it, it's not one that's been suggested to me before, I don't think. Can Tony, I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah can I just add, I, I don't think sure. the old, the ambition okay. of removing a lane. Thanks, thanks I'm going to stay with, uh, with you for this one. Sorry. Sorry. So hopefully if you can hear me, we're going to from Don Sibley from West Reading. So I'll just let the uh, us catch up. Hopefully you can hear yeah, me OK. And uh, so you just had a point on the previous one. Yeah, George. I think you're OK to go, Tony. Yeah, I just wanted to add to, to what Adele said. It's not a case of either or. What we what we need to do is to uh, dissuade, disincentivize, penalize indeed vehicles that are using Reading as a shortcut. Um, reducing traffic on the uh, IDR is something that we would all welcome um, and therefore some form of charging uh, scheme um, would uh, disincentivize and could penalize people simply using Reading as a shortcut um, and that would then enable us to look at removing uh, um, some of the road space around the IDR uh, and reallocating it for cycling. I wouldn't necessarily suggest walking, uh, but for uh, for cycling um, or public transport. And the other objective uh, that I particularly am keen on, and uh, there's a long-standing uh, objective, is to see sections of the IDR decked over um, so that we can actually deliver some open and green space uh, in the centre and cover over uh, that uh, real planning disaster, which, as you rightly say, Adele, um, my uh, and our forefathers on the council and uh, uh, did us a disservice. But um, that was the mode in the 50s and 60s, uh, and we now have to uh, redress that. Sorry, George. No, thank you, Tony. I think I kind of uh, kind of lost my connection briefly as well. So sorry if I talked over either of you. But I just wanted to um, ask. Uh, Adele, this next question um, about school streets. So uh, the question is, Adele, from Donna Sibley from West Reading. I read about some good measures in the draft publication, but I wanted to ask specifically about Reading Council's provision for school streets and how these will work. Will there be signage and messaging to drivers to take care, drop speeds and expect pedestrians in the road? Adele, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. But also I'm just going to endorse, can you imagine decking over the IDR and building a park on it? be wonderful I'd love to do that um okay so um yes school streets now school streets are very dear to my heart this is something that has come out of and been endorsed by the cleaner air and safer transport forum uh, it was in fact the topic of our first forum um so it's something that I'm determined to see there is a I'm, I'm, I think we're going to put the link to it in the Q&A or fact sheet that comes out after this there's something called the Hackney school streets toolkit Hackney were one of the first London boroughs to develop school streets they're now used in multiple boroughs across London and it is what it says it's a toolkit it's a method for um, council officers to use to see how to use school streets how to implement them um, in their local authority and at the core of school streets is it must have community support it's got to come from the school it's got to come from the parents at the school it's got to be supported by the community around the school so I think that's something that's really important to say right from the start this isn't a case 
of the council sitting there and going, right, that school, you're having a school street. What we are doing is approaching schools and saying we're going to bring school streets. We're going to make this opportunity available. Do you want this opportunity? And would you like more information about it? So we're not just sitting back and waiting for schools to come to us, um, but it does have to have support from the school com community. It's not something we can impose. There are lots of different models of school streets used in different boroughs and different places uh, across London. Some of them have pull up bollards. So they actually block the street. This is, oh, and I should probably explain for anyone who's watching this who doesn't know what a school street is. It is a scheme where the area around a school, uh, the little network of streets is closed to through traffic at the start and the end of the school day, usually for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And the aim of that is to dissuade parents from driving on the school run. Again, we go back to these short, non-essential car journeys. And I know some parents will have no other way to do the school run other than the car, but lots of people are doing it because it's convenient and they're traveling onto somewhere else and it feels safe to do that school run in the car. Um, it is actually by taking your children to, car, to school in the car, they're actually uh, inhaling more pot pollutants than the children who are walking and cycling, by the way. And that's because you're enclosed in the car with it. Um, but so it's just dissuade those short journeys and also make parents feel more confident uh, that their children will be safe walking, scooting, cycling to school, particularly older primary school children as they start to have that independence of doing the school run by themselves. And I know that again as a parent, um, that bit where they don't want to be walked to school with you anymore. They want to go by themselves and you're mapping out where's safe and where isn't safe. And still, I am very reluctant about a year six child of mine crossing my own road. Um, so I, I do feel for people with that. So there are different ways of doing it. Some boroughs and some places they will pull bollards up and just nobody comes in and out for that half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, others, they this works in areas with parking permits. They have AMPR cameras and they fine anyone who drives into that area who doesn't have a parking permit for that area. So that model lets residents in and out, but means that people coming from outside the area can't come in and out. And the method that you use or that we would use in Reading would very much depend on the school and what would work for the school. Obviously, number plate recognition isn't going to really work if you've not already got a list of the number plates of the cars in the area. So I can't answer the question of exactly how it will work. But if I direct you towards the Hackney School Streets Toolkit, that is what we're basing it on. Um, very soon we're going to have a, a form up on the website for schools to apply. It's already gone out in the school's newsletter and when the form goes live we'll be going out again. We've got some interest uh, from some local schools already which is great and also from some groups of parents and so what we're hoping is when we get the first few school streets in then other schools and other parents will see the benefits of it and then it's something that will snowball across the borough. Thanks George. Thanks Adele, that's really helpful. Um, it's got Another live question, but before we get to that live question, I noticed Ali's come back and just said uh, actually what you've responded to, both you and Tony, in terms of removing road space, some for cycling and some for mini uh, parks greenery. So it goes back to the point about decking over the IDR with the, uh, with the, with the new park. Um, so next question, a live question from Mike Abdullah. Uh, he asks, I'm enthusiastic about your plans for cycling improvements, particularly to Reading Bridge and Silver Street. One clear bottleneck remains there, which is travel between north and south of the railway, e.g. on Baston Road. Are there any plans there? Tony, can I pass it on to you? Um, so but the, just repeat that, George, about uh, about not getting about getting north and south of the railway line on bicycles. So, yeah, basically say, yeah, so uh, would you travel between north and south of the railway line, e.g. on Vaston Road? Are, are there any plans there? Um, right. Well, I mean, Vaston Road um, is obviously um, an area where we currently have uh, bus lanes uh, which are open to cyclists. So I recognise that the roundabout um, is uh, regarded by some as pretty daunting. We've recently altered the spiral markings there to improve road safety uh, for all uh, users. Um, the other issue that will be more attractive to cyclists is that we're committed to uh, allowing cycling through the tunnel at the station. Um, so uh, from um, uh, from Vaston Road, uh, you would be hopefully uh, in the not too distant future uh, because we're currently looking at repairs to the roof there. Uh, but we recognise that in the context of improving cycling and connectivity north and south of the railway line, it is unrealistic and impractical uh, to continue to ban cycling uh, 
um, in that subway. And it also links to the uh, plans that we have for the redevelopment of Station Hill to accommodate uh, cycling um, around and through that uh, site. Uh, so um, Vaston Road is a challenge um, and the area um, around uh, the station. Uh, but believe you me, we are uh, looking at a range of options to improve walking and cycling um, across that uh, busy road. And indeed, if the redevelopment of the uh, SSE site on Vaston Road um, takes place, um, there will be a direct link from the Christchurch Bridge through that site, uh, then across Vaston Road to the tunnel um, subway that I've just referred, which will then become a much more attractive route. Thank you, Tony. Uh, so just to remind viewers, if you uh, want to publish a question, uh, that top right hand box, if you can tick on, on that and then open up the screen and post your question. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got a question that was submitted uh, before this evening from Brian Fulway, uh, perhaps one for Adele. So Brian asks, can you advise if consideration has been given uh, of the increasing number of e-bikes in the proposal, please? My understanding is that they can be used on cycle lanes and shared pedestrian cycle pavements. Given that e-bikes can go at 15.5 miles per hour, any increase in their usage on existing shared pavements will greatly increase the danger of young children and elderly pedestrians in particular. Adele, can I ask that one of you? Yeah, thank you, George. I think there's, there's two elements in this question, and thank you, Brian, for sending it in. Um, one of which is about e-bikes and their use and their nature, and the other one is about shared use pavements. If I can deal with e-bikes first of all, again, for those who don't know, so the, the electrical assist bikes, so it's not like a motorised right, sit-on scooter that will just drive for you. You have to pedal, and then you have a battery and a motor, and that will um, put a bit more power behind your pedal. So they are really good a solution for people who live at the top of a tall hill that they otherwise might struggle to cycle up. So if you live at the top of uh, uh, Kentwood Hill, if you're in Caversham Heights, if you're in Emma Green and you think I'd be fine heading into work, but on the way back, that would be a nightmare. An e-bike is what you want because that will just, you will go up a steep hill as though you're cycling on the flat. And um, they're also good for people who worry that their fitness might not be uh, sufficient for them to be able to do, to cycle a, a journey to work or a journey along to the shops and haul a lot of shopping back. And also people, it's a genuine concern. People say, I don't want to cycle to work because I don't want to arrive all hot and sweaty. Again, an e-bike takes the power out of it. You are still getting some exercise. You are getting the benefits of being in the fresh air and taking activity, but you don't have to slog quite as much as you would with uh, a standard non-motorised bike. Now, as Brian points out, they cut out at 15.5 miles per hour. They're legally required to do that. Now, a fit cyclist on a road bike can go faster than that. So an e-bike, you'll go faster than a normal bike uphill unless you're racing Bradley Wiggins. Um, but generally, if you're on an e-bike, you are that's the top maximum you're going to get because they are very heavy. That motor and that battery makes them quite a thing to haul when the motor isn't helping you anymore. Um, so you're not going to suddenly find lots of faster cyclists around because of e-bikes, because actually the fastest cyclists will not be on e-bikes. Uh, but then we move on to shared use and there is some concern around shared use and I think in some areas across Reading actually works pretty well um, and that tends to be areas where you've got long straight um, areas of shared use and not many pedestrians. I'm thinking about the new shared use that's coming along some of, along the A4 for example that I've used sometimes. Now for a really fast confident uh, cyclist shared use is not great because it gives way at side um, turnings and you do have to slow down and you have to be considerate of pedestrians and that's why when designing the LC whip where there's space the aim would always if there was sufficient money to have segregated cycle lanes um, but shared use we accept that it's for some cyclists if we're going to get people again I'm going to keep saying this those short unnecessary car journeys getting people cycling who aren't cycling now for some people though having that shared use facility will give them a bit more confidence to try cycling and also they will take the extra time. So one of our active travel schemes that we've got is putting those cycle lanes across Reading Bridge. And I've had some people contact me and said, well, why do you need to do that? You've got a cycle and pedestrian bridge that goes across. Now, Tony's already touched on the issue of the southern exit of that bridge at the moment, which is very narrow. So it's difficult to, to social distance through there. Um, but also you have um, 
it is shared use. It's shared use lanes to it. And so it's the route that I use when I'm going to and from work it's the, and going to and from the civic centre, because for me, as quite a sedate and risk averse cyclist, I'm happy to go a bit slower and give way to pedestrians to be away from cars. But by giving that extra facility to faster and more confident cyclists, we can give them a viable alternative to go differently. So I think with shared use, if we're providing alternatives, then you will get those more risk averse cyclists on shared use. Um, and so they will give way to pedestrians. Um, and also I will point out that in any mode of travel, you have people who are risk takers and inconsiderate. And those people who take risk and inconsiderate on a bicycle, and they do exist, um, are also inconsiderate when they're walking. And they're also inconsiderate when they're driving cars. It's not a unique behaviour to cyclists. So I understand Brian's concern. We've talked about um, shared use before, Brian and I. Um, but I don't think that the advent of e-bikes is going to increase risk taking behaviour on shared use pavements, because what we're going to have people using e-bikes, are the people who don't currently have the confidence to cycle or don't feel they have the fitness to cycle. And that is not the same group as the people who are inconsiderate when they're cycling. Thank you. George, can I? Certainly, Tony, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, 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 I thoroughly endorse what Adele's just said. It's a useful opportunity, this question, just to uh, hang a comment on about e-scooters um, and uh, just to remind everybody that uh, I, we, we refer to e-scooters in our transport strategy. It's one of the emerging technologies to which I referred, but they are, strictly speaking, all illegal at the present time. And the government has just uh, uh, is just consulting and is expediting its consultation around the legality of e-scooters. I would imagine they're likely to be legalised, but on what basis their use will be legalised, I think is the key question. Um, I would require them, the users to, uh, um, to wear helmets. In fact, I would require all uh, road users on cycles, on bicycles as well, but that's a personal view. But certainly with e-scooters, um, bearing in mind that they can comfortably reach 25 miles an hour, they should be on the road. Uh, we can perhaps allow them in bus lanes, uh, but the regulation around that needs to be transparent and standardised, as at the moment e-scooters um, are used and abused all over the place and they aren't even legal. Um, so we need to get that sorted so that we can plan accordingly um, as well as uh, in other towns and cities. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I'm just going to refer to a question that's on the uh, live uh, Q&A. It's from Tom from Tardhurst. So he refers to 2036, which is the, the lifetime of the uh, local transport plan being a long way away. He's asking what's planned for the next 12 months. Tony, shall I go to you first of all on that one? So uh, you broke up, George. All right, let me, so let, me, let, me, let me try that again. So Tom from Tardhurst uh, says 2036 is a long way off. Yep. What's planned for the next 12 months? Well, the next 12 months, we've already announced the uh, initial schemes uh, that uh, were shown on that uh, map, three of which we're looking to introduce by the end of June. We're looking to bring forward proposals in the next few months relating uh, to other schemes. Um, but uh, what the next 12 months will bring, well, unless, Tom, you've got a, a crystal ball uh, that we can share, uh, the fact is that we will have to go with government guidance uh, around the restoration, for example, of the use of public transport, critical to the future uh, of Reading, um, and a whole raft of other impacts economically will shape the way in which we uh, respond in Reading. And we're working with our, um, with Reading UK and other local businesses because we're determined to assist the recovery uh, as much as possible. There's like to be local unemployment. We're going to have to look at retraining uh, initiatives. And so the way in which we travel will need to respond um, to that. So at this point in time, uh, I wouldn't want to say any more uh, than that. Business as usual um, is not the order of the day. I don't think we're ever going to go back to the way in which we operated uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but the extent to which traffic is reduced and all the other things we've been discussing this evening uh, are very much up uh, 
for grabs. But I think what I would say is that our transport strategy developed pre-pandemic certainly uh, stands us in good stead for looking at the way in which we respond to the pandemic and afterwards. And there isn't anything in there uh, that I would strike out. There are elements that we may want to advance uh, and give greater priority uh, to. But I think in terms of a strategy, it is a document that will stand us in good stead. And certainly it is a long time. There will be revisions of it over every four or five years we would look to revise it. So it's not going to be set in uh, stone and unamended between now and 2036. And uh, uh, I doubt very much I shall still be on the council then, although never know. Uh, but uh, uh, the fact is that technology is changing so fast, we need to be uh, in a good position to respond to that technology. And again, this document, I think, uh, uh, is remarkably prescient uh, in recognising that we will need to think smartly and respond to those changing conditions. Um, so hope I can't say more uh, than that. Adele, have you got any more access to that crystal ball? Uh, well, I think the only thing that I would add to what you've said, Tony, is that, of course, you, you mentioned with, it depends on the government. With, is, we also depend on the government for funding. I mean, we have yes. got this strategy. We have got a whole local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. There's a huge amount of stuff that we could push forward if we could only afford to do it. We've got big plans. We don't have big money. And council funding has been cut successively year on year for the last 10 years. We've just been told to spend whatever it takes to help people through the pandemic, which now seems to be very back on. Councils are looking at facing quite a big, well, a really big bill for the pandemic. And so it's not really possible to say, yes, we're definitely going to have X amount of money for um, making these changes that we want to make. The government has said there is this money available for active travel. They've said 250 million for immediate uh, schemes. They have not told us how to get that money. They've not told us what the process is going to be, how it's going to be divided up. Um, they've also said a further two billion um, for walking and cycling, which sounds great. But when you think about the number of local authorities there are across the country, actually, it's not really big money. And five years. Yeah, exactly. Um, but if we did have big money, we could do big things. So we are rather in the government's hands on this, I think. Um, we you, have had details of the uh, the money for public transport support. And as Adele says, the government has been very good at allocating okay. these seemingly large sums, uh, but uh, uh, no local authority is any the wiser as to what share it will get of that. And until we do, we won't be able to progress with, um, with most of these things. OK, let's um, let's turn back to let's turn back to the um, questions. Uh, hopefully you can hear me OK, but yep. there's a couple here related to Oxford Road. Um, so the first question, would you consider making Oxford Road one way to give priority to pedestrians and cyclists in this populated area of Reading? How lane now two way uh, two ways of traffic are open. Uh, so you'd come up Oxford Road from central Reading, but then have to go down Portman Road, making one side of the road safe for cyclists and pedestrians. And, and before we uh, ask one of you to answer that question, the next question from uh, Louisa uh, again asks about um, the issue about cyclists expecting to share bus lanes on Oxford Road. So there's some Oxford Road kind of uh, based questions uh, here, which um, Adele, would you like to uh, answer that first of all? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of come in briefly, but I'm going to hand over to Tony for the technical stuff because he's been involved in the Oxford Road sure. Corridor study uh, throughout and, and I haven't. So he's going to be able to answer that better than I can. Um, I would love to see Ox something happen to Oxford Road so that it is no longer a direct route in and out of the town centre. Um, I, whether it's a bus gate in the middle, I don't know quite how you do it. If you went one way, it's going to cause problems for the buses. Um, you do need to be able to. It, it's really important public transport route. Uh, but there may be a way that we can prevent uh, cars using it as a route into and out of the centre. Uh, not to harp on about Walthers Forest, and we were just talking about funding. They had £27 million uh, to do what they did in Walton Forest. So uh, whilst we can aspire to it, we certainly don't have that sort of money. Um, but there is a road, if you go and have a look at their website, and I'm trying to remember, that, I think it might be the Orts Road um, that they show a picture of. And the before picture looks just like the Oxford Road. And the after picture is lovely and all the businesses along it have found business has gone up. It's become a real community benefit and they have taken space 
away from cars, they prevent it from being a through route. And it means that there's more space for people on the road and it benefits everyone who uses the road. So I think, yes, there is potential to do something um, for Oxford Road. I'm not convinced that one way is the other, but um, Tony does know more about um, the history of the plans for Oxford Road and the forward plans than I do. So I will pass that over to him. The Oxford Road is an incredibly long road and a very mixed uh, road um, and uh, uh, at its uh, uh, busiest, it, the stretch uh, between the Norcott Road uh, roundabout and Reading West um, is a very mixed uh, parade of shops serving a local community. Um, and there are a range of uses there that need to be protected and enhanced, uh, perhaps more diversity, uh, more cafes and street culture, um, could be accommodated. Parts of the Oxford Road are very wide, albeit some of it is in private ownership. And uh, the key message <clears throat> about the Oxford Road is that we would be looking to consult with businesses and residents. Uh, the most recent consultations were a few years ago. Uh, there was a consensus about the need to reduce the amount of through traffic, and that was about the only uh, consensus. Um, and uh, certainly the uh, completion of the Cow Lane bridges means that we're in a position to uh, look to introduce measures along the Oxford Road that reduce the incentive for through cutting, uh, through traffic, but protect, as Adele rightly said, public transport. The number 17 is the busiest bus service outside of London in the south, what well, certainly was before the uh, pandemic. Um, and it's a vital link and a very important service. It needs to be protected, needs to be enhanced, um, and certainly any measures we take uh, need to protect public transport whilst increasing uh, walking and cycling opportunities, but also providing and protecting the economic vitality of all those shops and uh, businesses along there. So you've got mixed interests, um, and whilst everybody understandably sees their own journey in very much a uh, uh, a, a, uh, um, a single uh, journey, uh, all those interests need to be taken on board. So we don't have any specific uh, proposals for changing traffic flow uh, along the Oxford Road. We do have proposals for environmental uh, improvements. And the issue of something like a bus gate uh, is something I think uh, is a very attractive and relatively cheap option for preventing uh, through traffic, um, but all whilst also protecting the economic vitality um, of that area. And so uh, um, we've got much more work to do. Um, and again, as Adele said, funding um, is a key part um, of that. And if we're going to take forward proposals, we would be looking for local businesses, ideally, to contribute there. Uh, share of environmental improvements that are likely to benefit them um, as well as the local economy. OK, thanks, Tony. I'm um, just conscious of time. So there's uh, perhaps we can ask just a couple more questions before we before we wrap we started up. started late. Yeah, I appreciate we started late. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, everyone's got their evening to uh, dig, yep. dig it on. But there's a couple of interesting questions that I'd like to ask you. So fairly quick answers, if I may. So Jane has message to say uh, I live in I don't have will the bike Tony one for you just don't George I didn't get a word of that I don't know whether Adele did uh, yeah. was was it about it, it sounded like they're in the town centre and it, it's about secure bike storage yes yeah, so let me try let me try again hopefully so yeah. uh, live in the town centre in a flat don't have room to store a bike will the bike hire scheme return did you catch that yes so will, so will the bike hire scheme return Yep, Tony. The intention is for a bike hire scheme to be returned to uh, Reading. We're in discussion with a number of uh, potential operators. Uh, to be upfront, the issue is whether or not we are willing to reintroduce a subsidy. We, rem we had to remove the subsidy to Ready Bike as a result of the £50 million worth of government cuts we've had to absorb. That wasn't a decision that uh, I was particularly keen on. Uh, I think we need to review the issue of how we assist the re-establishment of a bike hire uh, scheme. We're in active dialogue 
we certainly want to. And the other point I would make is that in terms of uh, uh, bicycle storage, we need to up our game on that front and all new planning consents for developments in the town centre and around Reading require there to be uh, proper bike storage um, included in the design of those flats, which of course was not the case when many of the town existing town centre flats uh, were provided. So uh, we're well on the case and I hope we might be able to make an announcement uh, later this year. Adele, do you want to add anything on bike hire? Um, no, I think you've covered it on bike hire. Um, we are also looking at um, e-bike hire as well as um, traditional bikes. I think one of the reasons why the original ready bike scheme was difficult to make a profit on without the council subsidy um, is because it couldn't reach those hillier areas that I was talking about earlier. You couldn't, you couldn't get up Kentwood Hill on one yep. of those bikes. Um, I own a bike like that myself. No, you absolutely can't. Um, so e-bikes would extend the range of the scheme and make it practical for people living further out. I'm in Caversham. Uh, my um, nearest bike hire station was down in the centre of Caversham. And by the time I've walked there, I might as well walk all the way to the station if it was taking it to the station. So I think scope and range is part of it and e-bikes would help. Um, and yes, we actively want to bring in more secure bike storage um, hubs. We're looking at um, maybe bringing in ones that you can have on the street and you can get sort of six bikes in those. Um, but there's also opportunities for people to have subscriptions to much bigger bike hubs. And it is it just all comes down to funding. The will is there. It's finding the money to do it that is where we're struggling. Thank you, Adele. So just one last question. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Um, I can't just so one last question. So uh, this relates to um, the proposals to redevelop the old power station site opposite the station. Um, so that's the, uh, SSC. It's the yeah. yeah, it's the SEC site, as you say, Tony, and the proposals there is for a zigzag uh, cycle path through the site. This is from Mike uh, Abdullah. Uh, so instead of a straight path. Uh, so that's completely uh, opposite the idea that cycling should be there for transport, not just for leisure. Um, is there any update? there for Mike on, on that site and perhaps uh, you could speak generally about um, uh, planning and, and how uh, cycle routes um, are managed and planned through planning applications Tony. Well I won't comment on the SSE site because my, sure. I'm a member of the planning committee and I will have that uh, application in front of me fairly soon but I know Adele has been along to one of the more recent consultations on that and she might want to fulminate more frankly than I uh, could. Um, but in terms of the wider uh, planning considerations, uh, our planning policies and the local plan to which I referred earlier is very strong on the need to provide not only a proper bicycle parking, but also to accommodate the interests of, uh, of cycling when we plan those larger sites. And so the discussions, for example, we've been having with the Station Hill developers have uh, uh, included quite a large amount of time on cycling. And indeed, Adele and myself have had uh, a meeting with the developers um, at an earlier stage in the process. And uh, she and I and colleagues have made clear how we want to see cycling uh, accommodated um, within that development and not to the north of the station um, where we're talking to developers as well. The interests of cycling uh, have not been forgotten, which is why the uh, importance of allowing the subway to be opened up uh, is so fundamental because if we're promoting cycling to the north and south of Vaston Road, it's pretty stupid to then ban it through the one link uh, under the railway uh, line. So um, our planning uh, policies uh, actively accommodate um, the interests of cycling. But as with all planning applications, eventually there will some be some trade-offs that have to be mined, but we are made, but we give it a higher priority uh, now than when I first came on the council many years ago. Adele? Yes, thank you, Tony. Um, as you say, I'm not on the planning committee, so I can say pretty much what I like um, about those people's plans. Um, I've been following this uh, from the beginning. Uh, there have been many iterations of that site. It is a key 
active travel link between my side of the river, Caversham, and the station. It's so important. It could uh, possibly be the most important active travel link that we have in Reading. So it's important that we get it right. And there was an earlier iteration of the plans that had an almost straight um, line sweep from the bridge through. Uh, so I was not just disappointed, I was, quite, I was shocked when I saw a later iteration and it had two steep bends in it. Now, I've, I've spoken to the developers now on numerous occasions. Um, I understand why they're doing it. It's because they want to create a sense of place for their development. Um, but unfortunately, they have to accept that their development is this important connecting route for people walking and cycling to the station. And when you are heading to the station or into the centre of Reading, you don't want to stop and enjoy a sense of place. You want to get there quickly and efficiently. Um, so I have said to them that if it comes before the planning committee in that format with those two bends in it, they have widened them out. They have listened uh, to a certain extent to what I've said. But for me, they've not gone far enough back towards that, that they had before. Um, I will be objecting to it at planning on those terms. And then it's up to the committee what they do. Then obviously they, they're not allowed to form or express an opinion before the meeting. Um, but I certainly um, am not happy with the, with the plans as they stand. I don't believe that they deliver what we want to deliver for Reading. Thanks, George. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Tony. So we'll wrap it up there. So if I can just thank everybody for, for joining us this, this evening. Uh, this event will be uh, has been recorded. It will be available online afterwards. We will publish uh, some answers to the questions that we've received uh, before and during this evening. Apologies if we did not get round to your question during the live session this evening. Um, we've had over 100 comments already on the local transport plan at consultation. Uh, it uh, carries on until the end of August, so uh, please do submit your formal comments to that consultation. After that period of time, we will obviously look through those comments, analyse the uh, responses that have been received and present uh, the local transport plan for approval at some point later in this year. But again, if I can just thank everybody for joining us this evening. Again, apologies for the late start and for putting up with the technical difficulties. Uh, but it's our first time we've done this and uh, hopefully we'll have some positive feedback uh, to share from the event. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.